Okay, so uh, my name is David Dewitinsky, and I'm from Adelogix, a small security company in the UK. And today I will be talking about uh, securing Fluentbit by way of fuzzing. And I would like to thank both the Fluentbit maintainers, Calypsha, and also the um, CNCF for making this work possible, which means that they essentially funded this work. So thank you very much for that. And obviously also developed the tools such that we could do this work in the first place. Um, so I know a quick overview of what I will be talking about today is uh, I'm going to first give a brief introduction to what is fuzzing, kind of like from a developer's perspective. And then I'm going to talk about uh, how we fuzzed Fluent bit and what the results were that we found, and then also discuss what future work uh, we have. So in brief, how many here has uh, heard about fuzzing before? No one. Oh, one. I think there was two. Two people. Three people. <laughs> it keeps going. Okay. So essentially, uh, fuzzing is a way to automate test case generation. And test case generation, in this sense, means uh, input to kind of like a proxy test that will explore code coverage uh, in, in many different ways. Um, and the idea here is that Fluentbit is written in C, which makes it susceptible to memory corruption issues. And the problem at hand that I will be talking about in this case is how we can use fuzzing to generate test cases for Fluentbit and then find bugs in that way. And in short, the solution is to implement a lot of fuzzes and running them continuously with a project called OSS first that I will also get in depth with in this talk. So this talk is about essentially finding bugs in Fluentbit using various automatic test case generation approaches and in this case, fussing. So in short, it is, this talk is about fussing Fluentbit to find bugs continuously with OSS Fuzz. And the idea here is not just, we are not just looking to find bugs for the sake of finding bugs, but the idea is if you keep finding bugs, eventually you will stop finding bugs because you have found all the bugs that are present. So fussing introduction. Fussing is essentially a, a way to generalize unit tests in many ways. This is certainly not the whole truth, but I think that this is the way we have done it for, for Fluentbit. And on the left, you have uh, a, an example of if you were to test uh, API with many different inputs, you would just have a sequential set of statements testing the given API with input one, input two, input three, and so on. And the way you would kind of extrapolate this into a fuzzer is to have a loop that calls into my API, and then instead of using fixed inputs, you will just ask the fuzzer, give me some input. And there is then a lot of underlying technologies that means the input the fuzzer will give you is kind of reason about it come up with in a semi-random way that makes sense in this context. I'll get into what makes sense means in the next few slides. And the way it actually looks in code is uh, we have a very simple fuzzer down here in the lower right corner. There's a fuzzing stop, and that gives you a buffer of data. And this is the kind of like random data that is given to you by the fuzzer, which you will then have to propagate into the target code that you are analyzing. So here's an example of a fuzzer that has uh, for the, uh, it's, it's a library called JSONC. And the example fuzzer here essentially explores all of the passing code in this given uh, JSON library. And you can see that the only thing it does is it takes the uh, buffer of an uh, unsigned integer 8 buffer, it interprets it into a char pointer, so just typecasts it, and then it creates uh, some, some type of struct here from the JSON library, and then it calls this JSON token power CX. And that will essentially, after a while, generate data such that all the data passed to this function will explore all the so like code in this JSON token parse function. And this is essentially what we are looking to do for, for Fluentbit. So one of the myths that I would like to debunk is that fuzzing is just random testing and it's not going to work for our project because we have complex data structures and so on. We have just gave a talk a few minutes ago about fussing a lot of CNCF projects, and this is something we often hear from CNCF maintainers that random testing is not going to work in, in our example. 
the truth is that fuzzing did start as random testing. That's how it started 30 years ago. But since then, there has been a lot of academic work, a lot of practitioners, and so on, really trying to optimize this strategy uh, or this technique. And modern day fuzzers are not really random testers anymore. It's more accurate to call them generic, generic mutational algorithms. So it's essentially ways to, and also here it should say that modern day fuzzers refer, refer to coverage guided fuzzers. And there are hundreds of academic papers on how to improve fuzzing in the last decade or so. So this, uh, just a, a little heads up, if, if you have this kind of view or have heard that it's random testing, it's a lot more than that as well. And I'm going to try and argue a little bit about this. So the way a fuzzer works is that uh, it has this corpus set, we call it, which is uh, just a lot of inputs which corresponds to the buffers that you will get as input to this function, the data buffer here. You have a lot of inputs in this corpus set. And then the fuzzer will, over and over again, take a seed from this corpus, mutate it a little bit, and the mutation here will have a random element, and then it will execute your target program with that given uh, input. The, the program will then have been built or compiled in a certain way that includes a lot of instrumentation that the fuzzer will use to determine what was essentially the code coverage of the program when you executed it with a given input. And the idea is then, whenever you execute a program, you track the coverage. If it found coverage that the fuzzer had not previously seen, it takes this mutated input back into the corpus. Okay? And if it had already seen this coverage, it just discards the input. So it, so it sort of keeps going, generating, it has this corpus set, takes an input, mutates it a little bit, executes the program, sees what the coverage is. If it was new, save that input into the corpus set. If not, throw it away. And this will drastically reduce the complexity it takes to find inputs that explore the code under analysis. So say, for example, if you have this uh, simple C program on the right, composed of four if statements, it, has, it, it will check the first four bytes of a given buffer if they're equal to A, B, C, D. And if we just were to do random testing, we essentially had one in 2 to the 32 chance of guessing this right, because we would have to guess four buffers, sorry, four, four bytes, which is 32 bits. But in code coverage, sorry, using fussing, code coverage, coverage guided fussing, sorry, this will be reduced to two lifted to the eight, so we have to guess each byte, one at a time, which will be one in two to the 56 chance of guessing each byte times four. So let me show you what this means in practice. So at the first, we start with no seed, and we have to just guess the first byte, okay? We have a one out of 256 chance of guessing it right. So let's say we guess it right after 256. Then we save that input, the A, and put it in our corpus. And now we will just start guessing the next byte because we have already advanced through the first if statement here. And again, it will take two to 56 chance of getting it, and that just keeps going. And eventually, we have guessed all four bytes in 1,024 times. And this is really where, so like the coverage guiding element of fuzzing, which kind of became a thing around 10 years ago, kind of changed the whole way and changed the whole very way of fuzzing. And there are even examples online where you can generate, so for example, if you were to fuzz an image parser, the fuzzer will start to generate so like valid images of you know, arbitrary looking. And there are like examples of where you just have a corpus of random PN PNGs generated by coverage guided fuzzing. So in this sense, this is uh, so like why it reduces the complexity of guessing inputs. Okay, so when we are to do, fuzzing requires a lot of management because we need to save the corpus, we need to so like keep track of all the box. We need to make sure whether box are found or reported and all this stuff. And this takes a, a, a lot of management to do. So when we, were, when we integrated fuzzing into Fluentbit, we, need, we needed to have some way of doing this at a sort of like infrastructure level rather than just running our fuzzers a little bit every Monday or so. We need to have a sort of like big infrastructure that will take care of all of this for us. And we just write a, f a few fuzzers and then the, the sort of like infrastructure will take care of the rest. And all of these things, so like running the fuzzers continuously, deduplicating any bugs found, managing running of the fuzzers themselves, 
and also all the other like resource management related, we have this tool called OSSFOS to do this. And OSSFOS is a service which comes in the form of a GitHub repository that is run by Google. And the only thing you do there is you essentially integrate your project into OSSFOS by implementing a bunch of fusses, writing a simple Docker file and some build scripts to be put in the, uh, in the, in the GitHub repository, and then Google will start running all of your fusses continuously over time. So you integrate, and then it will just run your fusses indefinitely. Whenever the fusses find bugs, it will report it to you, and uh, they will also deduplicate, remove any sort of like false positives, and so on. Some false positives. Um, okay. And so Google will take care of building and running the fusses, reporting when bugs are found, verifying when fixes are found. So whenever we get a bug in Fluentbit, we get a, so like a stack trace, a reproducing input. And what we will then do is we will fix the bug on the Fluentbit side, and then Google will also verify for us that our bugs have been found. Sorry, our bugs have been fixed. So they simply take care of all of the, the management, and we only have to write the actual code that tests fluent bit and also do the fixes themselves. So in terms of fuzzing fluent bit, the workflow, the whole kind of like procedure that we have had over the last two years approximately, the first step was to integrate fu uh, fluent bit into OSS fuzz, implement a bunch of fuzzers that hit the fluent bit code, then allow OSS fuzz to run this, these fuzzers for a while. Then we would see bugs start to uh, appear. We would then fix the bugs, and then we would simply rinse and repeat, write more fuzzers to explore more code, and fix all the, the, the bugs that they uh, uh, report. So here's an example of a, of a fuzzer for the Fluentbit code. It's essentially all of the fuzzers that we have written are very similar to the unit tests that you will find in the Fluentbit repository. And you can see that, uh, so this is the full source code of the code, by the way. And this will essentially explore all of the code inside of the FLB start p time function. So we take the data given to us by the fuzzer, which is this argument up here. We then convert this data into two null terminated strings, because it will just be a complete binary blob, the data that we originally get. And fluent bit functions use null terminated strings, so we kind of have to wrap it into data that, that, that fluent bit understands. And then it will call into the uh, serp time function. You can see the link here to the fuzzer. Another example is uh, a fuzzer we have for the JSON parsing logic in Fluentbit. And again, it's a very small stop, 10 lines of code, where essentially only two of the lines are the important ones. We create a parser. And in this case, it's a JSON parser. And then we, and then we simply pass the data, data and size here that is given to us by uh, the fuzzer, we simply to, like, use that as input to the parsing routines. And this will explore almost all, I believe, of the code under the, uh, in the FLB underscore parser underscore do routine. There are a few caveats of some code it won't be exploring. I'll get into that later. But those are so, like, the small stops that we write in order to fuzz the fluent bit code. So very simple, very much like unit tests. The only difference is that we don't have specific data here. We kind of have data provided by the fuzzer. So all of this code is available. All of the fuzzers for Fluentbit are available in tests slash internal slash fuzzers. And there's also a PDF report in the Fluentbit repository, uh, I think from a year ago or so, where we document a lot of the findings at that stage and the, the fuzzers that we wrote. And the focus so far in terms of fuzzing Fluentbit has been on fuzzing the code in the SRC repository. So the code coverage as visualized, achieved by the current fuzzers, I think that there are around 15 fuzzers. And the code coverage we have so far is just about 44% 40, of the code in SRC. And this is, you can see so like a, a snippet of some of the code here uh, that is being, so like the, some of the, 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 the functions, sorry, the uh, files that are being targeted. And you can see, for example, the, uh, let's pick one file, let's say the FLB underscore parser. We have achieved 91% code coverage in that uh, uh, file, which is achieved by, I think, three or four fuzzers together. And this essentially just shows that we write a few stops of code and it will explore a lot of, so like the underlying code. Now, 
why do we not get necessarily 100% code coverage on some of these? And this is simply because we can't if we don't do a bunch of tricks. And there will be a lot of error routines that checks if malloc failed, which it never really does. But fa for example, that code we will essentially never explore unless we do some very triggery stuff to, to, to make malloc fail eventually. And there's a lot of these kind of cases in Fluentbit, a lot of error checking where we necessarily don't come into the case where uh, a system function should fail. And this is the reason why some of these code, uh, some of these kind of like files do not have 100% code coverage because all of the code that is so like actually handling on the, on the data and not just the logic of failed system routines, all that code we essentially explore in the, so like these uh, various files I showed. So what are the results that we have got so far? And the results in this case, uh, so I have shown essentially the code coverage is also a result in itself. But in terms of bugs that we have found, uh, first and foremost, what bugs are we finding? And in this case, we will find uh, all the bugs that sanitizers essentially give us. So sanitizers are these kind of bug oracles that will be compiled into a, a program, in, in this case C, and we'll so like do heuristics on whether you find buffer overflows, where they find nullity references, you will detect that in any way, and also memory leaks and all this kind of stuff. So heap buffer overflows, stack-based buffer overflows, nullity references, memory leaks, and inter integer arithmetics, those are the majority of the bugs that we find. And a quick note on this before I show the numbers is that not all bugs are necessarily true bugs. And what I mean by this is that um, Memory corruption issues are often th thought of as major issues. These are exploitable bugs that we can, you know, use to circumvent the application of Fluentbit. But because of the way fusses work, they will often be, they will often have some level of over approximation on the target code. Because we might, the data that the fusses generate might not be constrained in a way when calling into a given API that Fluentbit only so Fluentbit will do some manipulation on its data and may not be able to call into certain APIs with arbitrary input. So in this sense, some of the fusses that we have are over approximations in terms of what Fluentbit actually will, will use that given routine for, um, which is good from a security perspective because we kind of over approximate our, our security analysis, but it might also give a little bit more box that, than what is actually real when you deploy your, your Fluentbit. Also, I should say here that fuzzes themselves can have bugs. And in the numbers that I'm going to show you, that also includes, like they are also included, because they're a little bit difficult to filter out. And even the underlying fuzzing engines can also have bugs. So the bugs that we have found so far, uh, security relevant bugs from this at the end of this slide are a bunch of links, and you can sort of like reproduce these results. They include 30, 32 heap buffer overflows, and the majority of these overflows will just be off by ones that are essentially not going to have a major impact or, in, in essence, any impact when you deploy a fluent bit. There will be some stack, there are seven stack based buffer overflows, uh, a bunch of heap double freeze, and also use after freeze, and then also uh, 22 nullity references. So, this graph shows all the issues that we have found with fluent bit in terms of closed issues and open issues. What I mean by that is when OSSFS finds an issue, it will put it up on a database, in this case monorail, and it will then, what we have then tracked here is the number of closed issues and issues get closed when they get fixed, and number of open issues. So you can see that it often goes such that whenever new open issues happen, closed issues slowly uh, or right after increase, and that's because whenever a bug happens, we fix it. And the reason that the uh, red line will keep going up is essentially because closed issues will accumulate whenever a, box, uh, whenever a bug is fixed. And um, you can also see whenever uh, that the, the blue graph here remains fairly low, whereas the red one will keep increasing. And that's because whenever a fuzzer finds a bug, it will keep running into the same bug over time. So we fix that bug, and then it will start to advance further and thus it will find a new bug. So therefore, the blue line can somewhat be constant, whereas the red line will keep increasing as we fix bugs. Um, let me give you a few examples of bugs that it finds, because some of them are pretty interesting. So in this piece of code, uh, it found a, an issue, and it was an interesting one, because I couldn't see it when I just uh, uh, audited the code. And can everybody see what the bug is here? 
more or less. So SNPrintdef will take a format string and copy all that content into a buffer. Now the point is here that we use this uh, val len argument to uh, routine later on this FLB message pack gelf value. We use that as an argument uh, next to its uh, val buffer and val here will hold the contents of temp which is at the destination end of the uh, SNPrintdef function, okay? Now the point is here that SNPrintdef it returns, uh, so upon successful return, these functions return the number of characters printed to the destination. However, it says down here in the second paragraph, if the output was truncated due to this limit, some limit, then the return value is the number of characters which would have been written, meaning SNPrintf can actually return a value that is higher than the buffer holds, and it will just return a, a number, so like, a high number, and you will assume that's the, if you're not aware that if the value is higher than the size of your buffer, if you're not aware that that's an error case, then you know you will pass that. So like, you, you will use this val then will be a size indicating what was copied, but it's actually larger than the buffer itself. And this is a, was a pretty tricky one, because uh, it's easy to assume that the value returned is just the values copied, and that's all fine. So the, esen the essential check point here was, that then can be, uh, should be checked for whether it's larger than the size of temp. And that was essentially the fix. And this essentially returned in a, a stack based buffer overflow because that then would be passed down in the code with a size larger than temp. And in the code it would be passed down to, it would indicate the size of the given buffer, which was uh, larger than the size of the buffer. Another example of a, of a bug it found was. Um, in some of the sign before uh, code, which is, I think, related to some Amazon logic, um, we had this uh, routine that would uh, compare key, va key value pairs. And in this case, what actually uh, happened was that values could have the null value. And therefore, we would have a null point of reference uh, at the second string compare here. So the fix was really just to check for null values. Those are kind of the issues that it will find and a final one here. What's the bug uh, in this case? The bug is here that, uh, so here we have the, um, the logic of FLB, sir, and dub. And, well, this is also a null point of dereference because if malloc fails, it returns null. Uh, FLB underscore stir and dub will return null. And essentially, there's no check on that in the code which resulted in uh, a lot of null pointed dereferences in the very rare event that malloc would return null. But we have implemented some heuristics that actually can force malloc to return null, um, which, is, uh, which is good from the perspective of we have gotten to a stage where we need to really force random behavior and forcing malloc to return null in order to find bugs because we have sort of eradicated bugs in, in all the other parts of the code. So what's future work? Um, the future work is to essentially increase to a lot more code coverage. We're aiming to have 90% code coverage, uh, the fastest to have 90% code coverage throughout the, 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 the code uh, by this year. And we have to do some a little bit uh, exotic techniques to actually reach that, which is, for example, to force malloc to, to fail uh, uh, and that kind of stuff. And then we have also mainly focused on the, the code in the slash SRC folder, and the next goal now is also to target a lot of the plugins. And then also come with a little bit more uh, fuzzes that are not just like unit tests like, but more uh, integration end-to-end -end type of testing. And then essentially we will continue in the, in the current process of find box and the, sorry, find uh, gaps in the code that are not being hit by the existing fuzzes, develop fuzzes that target that code, fix the bugs that may come up, and then just rinse and repeat. So that's it for my talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>